Right, so Ian, do you mind just starting off giving us like a quick introduction of who you are, what you do, um, and then we'll kind of crack on with some questions. Uh, yeah, very happy to. Uh, so my name is Ian Cranshaw. I'm Head of International Trade at the Chemical Industries Association. Uh, I joined in 2016, so I've been here just short of seven years, uh, and that was after, gosh, uh, maybe 30 years in working for the UK government, uh, a number of which was doing trade work uh, overseas. So I was based in our embassies in China and Singapore uh, and also in the Middle East. Uh, so some experience of trade uh, and then happy to uh, switch to CIA, as I say, about seven years ago. Uh, so as well as my international trade role, I also run a networking group in the northwest of England, which of course is a massive cluster uh, for the UK chemical industry. So we have about 150 companies and not just chemical manufacturing companies, but also those in the supply chain. So they might be valve companies or, or consultants or IP specialists or, or anyone surrounding the, the chemical industry. Uh, so that's a really good aspect of my role. I also look after site directors. So, you know, you all have site directors on your manufacturing sites. So I run networking groups in the northeast, in the northwest, but also in Scotland. So every three or four months we get together and we share the latest uh, information relating to the industry, look at forward looks, look at health and safety aspects. Uh, what are the key things coming over the horizon that site directors might be aware of? You know, always we respect commercial uh, confidentiality laws, so we don't talk about prices, we don't talk about uh, anything specific, uh, but we talk about generic industry issues. Uh, and I don't think we ever have any issues about that. So that's a brief intro, is it? Is that the kind of uh, extent that? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Anybody? Happy to. And that's what I'd like to say. This isn't a presentation. This is a bit of a conversation. Uh, very happy to just answer questions as we go through. Uh, but let's see where we go. And I know that we've only got about 20, 25 minutes now. So uh, I think we'll easily fill that time on uh, on trade work. And I hope it's uh, of interest to all of your. Your guests. Yeah, sounds good. Right, so to kick off, I was kind of thinking, can you just give us some background surrounding trade and, and how kind of the chemical industry fits into that? Yeah, so it's quite interesting that I uh, I joined in in May 2016, and of course in June 2016, the landscape for trade changed uh, with the uh, EU exit referendum. So when I came here, I thought I was going to be doing the usual trade promotion type activity of leading groups of UK chemical companies to international shows. And that's what the CIA have done for, gosh, 30 years, 40 years maybe. Uh, so we do shows in the US, we do shows in Asia, uh, usually Japan, but we've also been to China, we've done events in Southeast Asia, uh, but obviously our core market remains the EU. So we do two events in, in Europe each year. Uh, but of course, as soon as the uh, EU exit was approved, uh, we got heavily into trade policy issues. So I think we'll spend some time today just talking about how the CIA has represented industry's requirements as part of our preparation for, for EU exit. I will start calling it Brexit because that's what everyone is more familiar with. And uh, this is the EU exit referendum was, uh, you know, the proper title. So. Uh, so everything did change and we've now got a uh, sovereign trade policy. That's a trade policy that we're completely responsible for. We can't blame the EU. We, you know, we're, we're on our own and we can set our own rules for the first time. So I'll touch about on certain elements of that if I can. One thing I've just mentioned, though, about the importance of the EU. So before the EU exit referendum, we did canvas views of membership. Uh, and not not a single member said that they would believe that the trading environment would be preferential outside of the EU. And one of the reasons for that is that we sell 60% of our products to the EU and we import 75% of our raw materials from the EU 27. So clearly the 
EU is our significant trading partner, and we don't really expect that to change. And we haven't seen that change significantly since exit in 2021, formal exit. Of course, we had the transitionary period. So that's really the situation. You know, we're, we're heavily intertwined within the uh, European supply chain. I call it European rather than EU. It's a European supply chain. We work collaboratively with all of our uh, partners uh, in the EU27, but also in Switzerland and other EFTA. Uh, that's the European Free Trade Association uh, group of companies. Uh, so we, we're heavy, we're integral to that European supply chain. And of course, supply chains are I think everyone's much more aware of the importance of supply chains following the COVID pandemic, you know, and if you couldn't import those key products uh, because of COVID restrictions, then, and again, we'll talk on later just how you can't look at trade in isolation. So if you don't have an industry, then you've got nothing to trade, you know, so all of the other areas, policy areas of the CIA, whether that be energy, whether that be sustainability, whether that be health and safety, uh, whether that be climate change, all of these impact on some of the trade considerations. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, slides because I, I know the last thing anyone wants is uh, death by PowerPoint, so I, I don't have that, I promise you, but just let me show you uh, two slides. So I think if I uh, do request to share my screen, then that might quickly work as long as I uh, open up the correct window. So that's just a simple uh, pie chart just showing where our exports currently go. So we've got exports of 62 billion. You know, one of the things that uh, Izzy and I had a quick chat last week just to uh, make sure that my remarks were going to be relevant to this group. You know, one of the phrases we use is that who, people often ask people who aren't in the industry, you're in the industry, so you know exactly how you, you buy and sell and you, you, who you trade with. But who, who is the customer of the, uh, the chemical industry? And, and it is actually the chemical industry because quite often you receive a material in, you process it, you refine it, and then you sell it on, often not to the end user or into a finished product, but into a you know, a more refined, a more performance chemical or a, a related product. And then it goes, you know, the plastics might go to an automotive molder, you know, to go into an automotive vehicle or an aerospace uh, product. So we often don't get right into the uh, the end customer. Uh, we, we, we're the middlemen producing the materials that are then used in other industries. And the other number that we throw out is that chemicals are found in 96% of manufactured goods. So actually, yeah, chemicals are pretty much in everything. So that pie chart shows you where our key markets are. North America, and again, we'll touch on this when we talk about free trade agreements, but yes, the European community is the largest block of countries of market for chemical industries in the UK, but that's 27 nations. So as a single country, clearly the US, uh, is is a significant uh, trading partner, which is why we encourage the UK government to pursue a free trade agreement with the US as a number one priority. And then the other chart that I thought might be useful, and this is up, this is my final slide, just to show really what's happened with trade over the last uh, four years or so. Uh, and they're broken down EU, rest of the world, uh, chemical EU and chemical rest of the world. So I just thought that that would be a useful way of showing that actually our exports to the EU haven't fallen off the cliff, uh, that that have been interesting spikes, but of course that was uh, probably influenced as much by uh, the COVID pandemic as, as, as our different trading relationship with the EU. Uh, but actually most of those areas uh, show growth since 2018 uh, and actually the only line that goes below the benchmark of 100 is actually our trade with the rest of the world uh, so really enforcing that even though the government focus now is to really encourage and you will have seen and i don't want to go on to it in too much detail but there was a big announcement last week that we've agreed accession that's membership of the cptpp 
So that's an economic block around the Pacific region, including Singapore, Malaysia, Chile, Mexico, Canada, uh, Japan. Uh, so, and it's important, it's 13% of global GDP, uh, but it doesn't replicate or it doesn't replace the value of that membership of the EU. Uh, so I won't focus too much on slides. So let me touch on, uh, if I may, and sorry, Izzy, you might have other questions, but I was just going to talk about some of the areas where we focused on in, in advising and working with the UK government on the development of that sovereign trade policy and what, what that really means. Yeah, no, that sounds really interesting. I just wanted to comment on, it's interesting to kind of see on that graph that a lot of people thought, oh, Brexit, like, trade with the rest of the EU has basically dropped off loads but it's just interesting to see that that's just actually not the case and the figures are there to kind of prove it but no okay yeah, carry on however you think. But again sorry I don't want to contradict myself because that would just confuse everybody but the one thing that we've also been looking at at CIA is where we are on value in comparison to volume because quite often trade stats are just what's the value of your exports and yes, our, the value of our exports seems to have gone up since we left the EU. But then you have to think, well, that's because the cost of raw materials have gone up massively and companies are passing on those costs to their customers. So even though the, the value of what you're exporting is showing an increase, are you actually producing more? So are you actually selling more of the goods than you were 10 years ago, say? And actually, we do have some more statistics and more uh, investigation on that to do. But already we know that UK production that is exported has flatlined to the EU over the last 10 years. And that's OK. It's, it's, it's flat. It's not in decline, uh, but it, it isn't showing the growth that financial exports are showing. So it just shows that you need to dig beneath the surface a little bit just to see what it is you're exporting and, and the value of that. So I want to stop sharing, don't I? So mm. you don't do, do that. So how, how do I do that now? Just let's share again. So yeah. I just want to so, um, stop sharing. So. Yeah, just listen to that. Would you like to have a look? Okay, I think, am I back with you? So sovereign trade policies, I'll just give you, let's say three uh, specific examples of, of, of what's having responsibility for your trade policy can deliver. So I'm sure most of you have heard of uh, anti-dumping measures, for example. Uh, we call them trade remedies. Uh, and the key word there is remedy. So the remedy is to correct the market dysfunction and that market dysfunction might be that you know a foreign market might be let's use an example of subsidizing the cost of their energy which is making them unreasonably competitive and actually able to sell their products at below cost uh, so if i try, try and give you an example of a remedy that's in place at the moment for example there is one on russia russian production of ammonium nitrate so fertilizer uh, so any import of Russian ammonium nitrate, of course, we're not trading with Russia at the moment since the uh, the invasion of Ukraine last March. Uh, but prior to that, any import of uh, fertilizer from Russia would come not just with the tariff, but then a 30 percent premium uh, penalty on the cost of, uh, of those imports because the Russian uh, producers were benefiting from you know an imbalance in in their cost structure because they were getting a subsidy from the state on the cost of that energy and that was unfair according to world trade organization rules so that's that's the other key point to explain that remedies aren't about protectionism you know because we're free traders you know the chemical industry wants to buy and sell and trade as freely as possible but they want to do so uh, with a, a decent, you know, pl level playing field of of companies following, you know, global trade rules uh, for trade. Uh, so it needs to be fair. 
Uh, and when there's a, a weakness or somebody's bending or breaking those rules, then a remedy can be uh, put in place. It's very political. Uh, there is always a, an influence. You know, the big sectors that are more proactive than us uh, are the steel sector. So you always hear about steel tariffs being increased or anti-dumping duties on excess production from China. You know, and why would China do that? You know, China's just had a real problem through the 2000s, 2010s, overproducing on steel and then dumping those products in markets. You know, and what the impact is, you could put domestic producers, UK steel companies out of business. And then within 10 years or so, you know, when there's no domestic production, suddenly the Chinese have the entire market and then they can, you will see the increase in prices and there's no competition to stop them. You have to buy your product from China. So that's why you need to balance uh, prices. Uh, even though, as I say, we do support global free trade. One of, one of the areas though, and this is so straight from 2016, we started having discussions with the Department for International Trade who led on the development of the Trade Remedies Authority. So it's a, it's a non-departmental public body. It's a quango, if you like. It sits outside of the department and it's supposed to be independent of, uh, of government. But as I say, it's politically influenced because the Secretary of State has to approve all remedies put in place. But one of the areas that we looked at was in the EU, they, they've been working for five years to modernise their trade defence. They call them uh, trade defence instruments in the EU, by the way. We call them trade remedies. Much of the world calls them trade remedies. So, uh, And one of the things that they have is the lesser duty rule. And this is where it gets really technical and I won't bore you. But, but basically, the UK government, because you have to recognise this is a Conservative government, I won't call them rabid free traders, but they are aggressively looking to get the cheapest costs of any imports for the benefit of the consumer. They genuinely believe in free trade. There are a number within government that think, wow, if the Chinese are prepared to sell you something at 50% of the cost that we can produce in the UK, let's buy everything from China. That, that is genuinely a belief uh, within many amongst this, uh, this conservative government. Uh, so we had to work for a, a number of years. We were arguing that the modernised rules in the EU, you were allowed to include on, on top of that uh, the tariff remedy, you were allowed to include up to 6% for uh, profits or, or damage caused to the industry or looking at other environmental impacts, because that's the thing about UK industry as well. And I think all of your companies will be looking at the cost of the transition to net zero uh, and the additional costs that you currently pay on your energy that is your green levy taxes and you're thinking well wait a minute the chinese don't pay those green taxes and, and the malaysians don't pay them and yet we're being made more uncompetitive uh, because we're doing the right thing for the planet you know so th there's lots of those things that are considered that the eu will accept that an additional premium, if you like, or an additional cost can be placed on imports from those markets that don't respect global environmental uh, rules. Uh, but the, the UK just would not accept that. So we lobbied hard. We worked for, I would say, three years, you know, trying to make the case for this to be included within the UK regime. And at the end of the day, they just said, no, uh, we will maximise the lesser duty rule is basically the lowest additional duty to, to correct the remedy with no additionality. Uh, so we found that really disappointing. We got lots of support from members, but it, we were just dealing with a government who believed, no, we don't believe you should be penalising imports beyond what the uh, the injustice is on that trade. I won't talk any more about that. So we've talked a lot about tariffs. So what are tariffs? I think you all know will know that they're just a tax on imports. So they're levied by HMRC, they're paid at the uh, point of entry. Uh, tariffs in, for chemicals are actually quite low. So they average less than 5%, but they're in bands of 4, 5 or 6%, which actually is quite low in terms of, of tariffs. Uh, if you think about the automotive sector, then the tariff is 10%. If you're looking at some dairy products, such as cheeses or milk or, or other farm 
production, then upwards of 25 to 30 percent is a, is a common tariff. But again, you'll recognise, you'll know that the farming sector has always been quite heavily protected because we do want that security of supply and security of supply is something that certainly the government are now looking at in the chemical sector. And again, post COVID, you know, what do we have to produce at home to make sure that if there's another embargo on a, a different state, have we got what we need being produced here? Have we got chlorine being produced to keep our water clean? Have we got, you know, there's a small company in the West Midlands who produce the smell that is added to natural gas so that you can use it safely in your home, for example. Have we got all of these key products, strategic products being produced in the UK all coming from very secure supply chains? So again, there's a, there's a huge amount of work going on in government now to really look at what we need to be you know, really certain uh, that we can always access, regardless of what happens in the geopolitical world. You know, who knows where we're going to be with US China uh, and the disputes that we're likely to face uh, there in the next uh, in the next few years. So that's quite interesting as well. Uh, so the UK set anyway, the UK set its own global tariff. It is called the UK global tariff. So we, they simplified it. Uh, there are now just three bands for chemicals, four, five or six percent. Any tariff that was below two percent, the UK government just decided they were known as nuisance tariffs and barely worth even collecting. So they just scrapped them all. Uh, and I think we welcome that. Again, we like simplification. We don't want our companies tied up in bureaucracy. So if they don't need to worry about those tariffs on very small uh, amounts, then just remove them. And that's what the UK government did two years ago when we uh, went into that transitionary period. Tariff suspensions was a bit, sorry, I am running out of time as well. Tariff suspensions, so we worked a lot on tariff suspensions. So these are temporary opportunity, an opportunity to remove a tariff for a two and a half year period. So why would you do that? So there might be a specific uh, market need, uh, there might be there, there has to be no market competition, so no domestic production, because you wouldn't want to remove a tariff on a product that you produce at home. You would rather rather encourage the companies to buy from a domestic producer. So if there is no domestic producer, then you can apply to have a tariff removed for a period of time. And I don't think you would want to remove it. Well, you wouldn't want to remove it permanently for a couple of reasons. One, you might be bringing that in from a country that you're looking to agree a free trade agreement with. Uh, so if you've already removed the tariffs on one of their key exports to the UK, what's in it for them in terms of a future free trade agreement? But also you don't want to shut down the opportunities of investment. And again, investment in the UK industry is absolutely critical. We want to increase the production capability in the EU. We, we want a, an environment that attracts foreign investment into our chemical industry. But if you're able to import all of the materials free of tariff, Free of tax, then what's the real incentive to come and invest in the UK? Because you can just import the product, do whatever processing you might want in the UK, and then and then sell on those goods. So they're a short-term suspension of the tariff. Which brings me to free trade agreements. So again, what we did at, at Brexit, all of the obvious uh, free trade agreements that the UK enjoyed within the EU, we quickly rolled them over into UK law. But now uh, the real focus is on securing uh, new free trade agreements with you know, growth economies around the world. So I've mentioned CPTPP and that announcement that was made last week. So we're joining the trade bloc uh, of 11 countries. So that, that was a significant move. Uh, we're very close to agreeing a deal with India. Uh, so that, that negotiation has been going on, I would say now for the last 18 months, maybe two years. Uh, but again, India is a, is a tricky one. Uh, and again, trade can't be seen in isolation. So you've got India and China currently importing massive amounts of oil and gas from Russia. So you've got the ethical issue of, wait a minute, they're buying cheap energy from Russia and then selling those products that are produced using that cheap energy into Western markets. How, how, how is that fair? So again, you, you look at the carbon border adjustment mechanism that the EU and the UK governments are looking at. So, and also carbon leakage. So again, these are areas that I'm sure within your businesses uh, you're aware of. Just, just to make sure that 
again, it's about fairness uh, and balance in, in the global trading system. Surely we shouldn't be aligned because our industries are already at a massive anti-competitive uh, position in relation to the US. So you might know that currently the US is at a 600% or a six times uh, preferred position on energy costs than the UK. And, and if you think the UK, and I checked these statistics just yesterday, so I know that they're still current. So the UK, what we're paying for our gas is about 120 pence per therm. So the, U, the US is six times more competitive than that uh, for their energy because they are they have security of supply, they are self-sufficient on energy, and that's largely through their shale gas reserves, uh, making them you know, very difficult to compete with. On top of that, you've got the £370 billion of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is sucking in investment into green tech and green investments, uh, many of them from our industry. Uh, and, and the I would say not just the UK industry, but the European industry is facing uh, challenges that we, exponential challenges that we haven't faced in in decades, I would say. So it's a really difficult time. What, what has helped, of course, is that 120 pence per therm that we're currently paying is far, far better than it was last year. So the markets reacted badly after the uh, the Russian invasion, we were paying upwards of 500 pence, so five pounds per therm. So actually looking at 120, uh, the industry is now slightly more at ease uh, that they are likely to you know, survive this difficult 2023 period. And there are some green shoots of demand returning for their products, uh, certainly by the third and fourth quarters of this year. And that's when you start trading again. Companies are running down reserves this year. They've all just had a bit of a shock, I think, from from a very difficult uh, last 12 months. Uh, but they will have to start restocking from second half of uh, 2023. Uh, so trade trade just can't be seen in isolation. Now, one last comment on uh, on free trade agreements. It's not just about removing tariffs. Uh, it's often the non-tariff barriers uh, that are, are the restriction on creating a nice, easy trading environment. That might be, and of course, we've got reach in the UK, we've got reach in the EU, and that, that's quite protectionist. I think most in the industry will recognise. Everyone else in the world said, wow, the Europe is closing its borders. To comply with reach is quite expensive. It requires a lot of documentation. We have to do all of our, you know, there you go. But we have a, a regulatory regime that some would accuse it of being restrictive. But there's lots of things within a free trade agreement, such as mutual recognition of standards, mutual recognition of qualifications, for example. So UK lawyers or accountants or doctors, you know, if you're qualified in the UK, which has very high standards on their, their education and their qualifications, you would be able to go and work in Canada, for example, or you would be able to work in Japan because they recognise each other's standards because they're all clusters, yeah, first world and 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 of a standard that you would comfortably accept in your country. Of course, the, the one standard, if you think about all those negotiations with the US, remember a few years ago, we were all worried about chlorinated chicken and, and the health and safety of, you know, farm uh, produced animals in the US because they don't have the same standards as we do. And that's the one area where UK government has been pretty tough actually in negotiations with Australia, with New Zealand, with with India now that we will not shift on our standards for animal husbandry and animal welfare and development. So it, it, it's good that we've taken that very strong position. But if you stick to that position, you're going to have to give something up in some other area. So we just keep an eye on making sure that they don't weaken uh, the chemical industry in any way. Is it? I just went off on one, but uh, I wasn't stopped, so. No, no, it's fine. I think it questions. was. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions before I jump in? I was just going to ask, um, in terms of this current year, what do you think is the kind of biggest challenge for trade in the chemical industry? So CIA conducts quarterly business surveys of members. So it's not even my viewers to uh, 
what the biggest challenge is. Uh, everyone says it's energy, so it's just the cost of competitiveness. You know, we you, you can't get beyond those high energy costs because they, they have to be passed on to the customer and the customer can bear that cost for a period of time. But eventually they they, they will look elsewhere uh, for their, their, those products, those raw materials, those processed goods. Uh, so that's why this year is so important and it's, it's, it's a huge relief that you know that the energy cost that we're look, we're seeing uh, is nowhere near as prohibitive as uh, we once feared. The second item that I would say, and this is why your group is so important, skills. Uh, chemical companies are crying out for people with the right skills to come into the industry, uh, whether that be chemical engineers, whether that be chemists, whether that be electrical engineers, uh, processors, lab people, uh, right across the board. It's a real employees market, so you are an incredibly valuable resource to your company. So, yeah, make best use of that. Yeah, that sounds I think it's difficult when you're kind of just doing your everyday job to understand like how much external factors such as trade and come into stuff and how they do kind of affect what we do every day. Um, and yeah, I think it was interesting how you said about some things being it's easy to kind of put remedies on and kind of do our push our own free trade, but you can't kind of force other countries to do that. But it's all interlinked, so it all will kind of get pushed back and forward until ideally you want it to be fair. But yeah, you can't force that because there's just so many factors that come into it. No, I found it really interesting. It's something that I, um, I assume not many people kind of dig deep into if it's not kind of the bread and butter. So no, I think that's been really interesting. That's the difficulty with China and India because they often produce the uh, the bulk chemicals. Uh, so it's often the higher end, the higher value stuff that we do in the UK. So actually, even though I raise some concerns about imports from China and India, you go to 100 chemical companies in the UK and they would all want lower tariffs from China and India because they rely on imports from those countries. So again, as a trade association, uh, we would never get a 100% view because there would be some companies who think actually we're going to be exposed to India and China, maybe not now, but in 10 years time as they continue to mature their, their capability, then they're going to be on our doorstep. So our products that are unique to us now or high value and, and specialist, the Chinese and the Indians are going to be there in due course. Uh, I'm not picking on China and India, uh, I'm just using them as an example. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Any one final remarks? Uh, just yeah, to, I, oh sorry, Samim. So you got you it. Go. Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, Ian, uh, thanks for that uh, summary. Um, I was wondering, do you have any thoughts about the organic growth of the UK chemicals industry and exports, especially regarding uh, greener chemicals, sustainability? Like, is the UK at the forefront of that when it comes to uh, net zero, but you know, producing more? sustainable chemicals and is there a growing market for that internationally? So again, and I did touch on the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that the US has introduced, so this $370 billion fund for supporting that kind of R&D and, and new products. Uh, and so our focus at the moment, yes, is massively lobbying the UK government, not for an equivalent because we couldn't match those those numbers, uh, but there has to be more support. There has to be a chemical strategy uh, within government for you know supporting the development of that, because without the chemical industry uh, meeting its net zero targets, then the rest of the UK will fail in its uh, net zero targets. So. Uh, industry has to be given the the opportunity to deliver you know hydrogen is only one part of that i know there are many other solutions but again you know high net in the northwest those providers in the northeast you know who will be sinking the uh, the co2 uh, in the north sea liverpool basin in the northwest via high net you know companies are prepared to do that and to establish those pipelines but there's lots of other infrastructure and decision making and policy that needs to be put, put in place by government. So government has a responsibility, companies recognise their own commercial responsibility, but it has to be a partnership. 
Uh, and that's where we've seen some failure in government over the last couple of years. I won't be too critical. We, 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 we continue to work with the uh, government as best we can, but we need clearer policy and quicker decision making on some of those solutions that are there. The technology is there, but it has to be driven forward. My question was going to be very similar, kind of thinking about the sustainability impact and things like carbon taxation in the EU economy and how that affects trade. But I think you've you've kind of covered some of the key things there, Ian. So um, just in reference to what Izzy was saying um, shortly ago, in terms of the day to day impact, how aware do you think UK chemical companies are of the impact of trade is it something that you see trickles down and there's the engagement on from cia members or is it something that you feel like there's a lot of um kind of information and training i guess if you can call it training that needs to go on within the cia community in the big companies they, they look after themselves they are billion pound a year turnover company so the crowders i was out at uh, in cosmetics global uh, last week in barcelona quite quite a nice couple of days uh, but crowder were there steve futz the chief executive of crowder was there you know really important market for them they don't come to the cia looking for trade advice you know they as a billion dollar company same with ineos you know they they have open doors to prime ministers and uh, ministers uh, and they get the help and assistance. But what they do is they lead our industry. So as globally recognized brands, it's really great that they support many of our initiatives. Like I've got a big event in Basel in Switzerland in May. So it's called ChemSpec Europe. So it's a speciality and fine chemicals show. So this is quite often where you might have the toll manufacturers or contract manufacturers who do lots of the innovation, lots of the uh, creation of, of, of new product going out to forge relationships with European partners. Uh, and, and I think they do that yeah, with support from us, with support from the UK government, but also with the champions of, of our sector, the, the, the multinationals that, uh, that we have. You know, the other thing that is difficult for us uh, in our industry has always been quite quiet politically. And one of the reasons for that is 70% of UK chemical production is by companies headquartered overseas. That might be US companies or Belgian companies or German companies based here in the UK. So they don't want to bang on to the UK government too vehemently on, on issues. They, they, they do their business, uh, but they don't want to see, be seen to be actively lobbying the UK government. They will do th so through us and through other channels, uh, but we've just got to make sure that we retain that investment rather than when well, we haven't seen divestment since Brexit. We haven't seen divestment unless the technology becomes obsolete. Uh, but it's just important for us to give those international investors in the UK, you know, the, the mouthpiece into government. And that's that's what we do achieve.